Yes, that I'm going to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting of September 13 to order at 3.35. And uh, we have most of the members of the committee present. So I'm going to uh, start by uh, doing a couple of the formalities and making sure that members of the committee can fully participate and then introduce uh, or have uh, share and introduce everybody from the library. It might be easiest to just do it that way um, to proceed. Um, this meeting is uh, being held by remote means pursuant to an extension of um, the open meeting law exception um, that was um, enacted by the legislature that does permit us to have um, remote meetings and um, we have made every effort to make sure that um, public can fully participate in this meeting. So um, with that being said, I'm going to first go through the, uh, oh, and I just want to remind everybody um, that this meeting is being recorded. Um, so just quickly through the members of the uh, Finance Committee first, just let us know that you've heard me and you, we can hear you and confirm we can hear you. So I'll go by first name only, Lynn. Present. Bob. Present. Matt. Present. Bernie. Present. Kathy. Here. Uh, Michelle. Present. And uh, I think that we're at this point only missing Felicia. Um, She's in the audience, so she can be brought oh, in. Somebody. Uh, John, since you're controlling, I think, bring Alicia in. And uh, Alicia, can you just confirm for us that you heard me? Yes, thank you. OK, thank you. So other people besides the members of the committee who I've just introduced, um, Sonia Aldrich, Sean Mangano um, are both here. Um, from uh, Paul Bachelman, Athena O'Keefe um, is uh, involved in the meeting, but she's uh, actually uh, not our minute taker today, but is going to uh, uh, help us out if we need to for as long as she can. She has other things that she's uh, in transit to. And Bill Kaysen is going to be our minute taker today. So with that, Sharon, you want to introduce uh, everybody from the library side? Yeah, certainly. So I have, we have Bob Pam. Uh, Here. Uh, Alex Lefebvre. Here. And Kent Ferber. Here. Thank you. <laughs> so. Uh, Andy, I just would like to note that we have other trustees in the audience. We have other counselors in the audience, and we have Representative Mindy Dom in the audience. Okay, thank you for uh, that reminder. And uh, we will be looking at to bring people into the into the meeting as uh, we can. So the um, thing that we wanted to start with today, and I uh, apologize to members of the committee that. Um, so much came in so late, but um, we really had a big ask of our um, colleagues at the library in the amount of information we were seeking from them. And um, I've been, uh, I'm very appreciative of the work that you did and the information that you provided. Um, it's gonna be very helpful to us. Um, we will try and discuss as much of it as we can today. Um, and I think that, uh, it will be um, certainly a part of how we proceed. Um, and more and more importantly, we will be able to get all of the material to the full council um, in a much with with more time before the next meeting than the finance committee had today. So, um, Linda, do you have anything that you wanted to say about the questions process before our, our and then I? as to how you would like to proceed or suggest we proceed? Um, I think that it would be useful for people to take a moment and look at the 
uh, responses to the many questions that we asked the trustees and the phenomenal job they've done in such a short time of turning those around. Uh, Sean has worked on some of the answers to the additional questions that are really for the town and I have drafted responses, uh, but not put them in the packet, but I'm prepared to go over them as well. So if we want, we can focus on the questions for most of the meeting. I think that would be helpful. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask a question of, and by the way, um, for people who are in the audience, um, I believe that everything has um, that we've received with the exception of a few spreadsheets that need to be added have been placed in council packets, including the one that's available on the website. Um, so that uh, uh, there is an opportunity for everybody to look at it. Is there a desire amongst the committee to have a few minutes to read themselves and uh, take uh, a few minutes of a break from the meeting to do that. Andy, I would love just a two or three minute recess just to look over everything really quickly. That would be great. Do you want to put it on the screen, Andy, so the people could actually in the audience also kind of go through it? Um. Do you have it on your, because I, I actually have it on a separate computer, so, so I can't share my screen to, to do that, but uh, if you could, or Sean, but are you thinking to start with uh, responses from uh, the library? Let me know if you want me to share anything. You're muted, Lynn. Yeah. I, you know, you might want to start with the one we got at 315 today, Andy, which was the responses from uh, from Sharon. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there was, a, I think, two versions of it that if you could put that one on the screen and then go through it slowly for a few minutes, that might be helpful. And we'll take a break from the well, meeting. Lynn, do, do you want me to go ahead and do that? Uh, please. Okay. And Andy, would it be possible to get Bob's spreadsheets added to the SharePoint at least? Um, or did you say Sharon, Sharon said they're in there? I'm sorry about that. The, the spreadsheets are for the most part uh, copied into Sharon's responses, but um, the uh, spreadsheets themselves can be added, uh, but it's going to be hard to do that right now. Sharon, can you just confirm that a, you can see this on the screen and that this is the right version? Um, you'd have to scroll down all the way to the bottom. It's the very, it's, um, the very, it's last, the very last attachment, attachment J. Um, just make sure that all the pages are there. Uh, three, is there a page four? If it's only the odd, then no. Um, did, okay, yes, yeah, scroll there's down. A, there's a five, page five. And is there a four? Uh, no, there's not. So okay, you, that's the wrong version then. Is, is it in the packet, the right version? Do you know? It, Sean, it, it's not. Okay, did you email that one again, Sharon? I'm just I, I, I did, a, and I'll do it to you right now. Oh, yeah. maybe you personally didn't get. I, I got one at 248, but I didn't get one after that. I get okay. one. Yeah, I just sent it to town council. Here we go. And Sean, you can load that into the packet too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There you go. And Sean, I will forward to you Bob's uh, spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. just, uh, just in case that I didn't include some okay. of them. So here's the here's the version you just sent. It's still only twenty five pages, but so <laughs> I want to make sure it's. Yeah, this one has the even number, so okay, good. Thank you. 
All right, so um, are we reading these, uh, Andy, or do you want me just to scroll every few seconds? I think uh, scroll slowly. And what I'm going to do now is I have my, um, I'm looking out for hands raised from attendee, or from panelists rather, members of the committee. And um, so I want to start by, um, as, we, as you scroll through, if any of the members of the committee have questions, raise your hand or speak up if you don't, if I don't recognize you right away. And yep. we'll try and um, pause at that point. So the first question is on the endowment and there are several sub questions. Sean, can I just ask that you also forward it to us because the version I have that came in at 315 doesn't have any page numbers on it. So I just want to make sure mm -hmm. when I print it out is not different. Um, I, I see there are page numbers on the one you're showing on the screen. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Yeah. Any and for, uh, uh, for all counselors who are attendees or panelists, um, Sharon did send both versions as email attachments to the town council address. So while uh, both may not be yet in the packet um, for council purposes. Yeah, Andy, did you want us to call out uh, either questions or comments as the pages? If you, have, if you see any quite as, as I said, if you have a question as we as something's being scrolled by, raise your hand or speak up and we will stop scrolling so that the question can be asked. Okay, so yes, go ahead. See it? Yeah, I did. I raised my hand. Yeah, I thought so. It just didn't show up as to who, but Kathy, go ahead. Okay, um, Sean, can you just scroll up to when it's the planned on draw on the endowment? Because I crosswalked the four to 4.5% and it actually comes out a bit higher than the 300 to 320. And just so people know, we're at a draw right now in the current year of 332. So it's one of the questions I wanna come back to because that the current one, FY23, has 332. And then the, as it does do a referral back to the Appendix A, you can see that the endowment is regularly above, um, except for one year, it's been regularly above 330. So my thinking as we went into FY24, FY25, FY26 is it would not likely be lower <laughs> than it has been in the past because the town has been capping its share at a two and a half percent growth. So I just want to, it's, it's the, the wording says 300 to 320, but when I did just a quick thing, it's, it's minor, but it was more in the 350 to 380 range. If we can keep a 4% draw and if we have an 8.2%, $8.2 million endowment. So I, I at some point want to come back to the endowment because I think it's, an important part of this puzzle. So it's it's just a point on how important the endowment has been to the library to for operations. And um, I know that on your screen now you see the budget presentation for 2018 through 2023. And um, the endowment is in the third grouping. Um, 
So it goes from 300,111 to in FY23, 332, 543. Alex has her hand up. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify, and, and Bob and Sharon can probably do a better job of this than me since I'm not on the budget committee, but the, the, <laughs> Like, like we always talk about, we have a fixed pot of money and what we take from the endowment, um, like we, we get what we get from the town and every year is different. So our FY22 is 317, right? And our, so some years we've bumped. In fact, if you look at the draw rates, which are down below, where are they? Are they in here? No, it's Exhibit E. Yeah, so if you look at Exhibit E, you'll actually see that our draw weights in some years were four and a half and five percent, and those were choices that were made because every year we obviously have to look at that. So it's really the the number that was given was the number that's the expectation, um, but it's our budget changes, right? I mean, if we are if we are have employees who have retired who we haven't replaced, that changes things dramatically. If we get more from the friends, which, uh, you know, that allows us to offer more programming. And so there might be years where we might be comfortable with a four and a half percent endowment draw, even though we're getting more money from the friends, because what that does is allow us to offer even more programming. So, I mean, it's just, it's not quite, it's not quite as like ABC, I think, Kathy, as, as perhaps other budgets might be. But again, Bob could probably speak to that much better than me. Uh, go, if you go back to, uh, stop for a second, go back to that slide you were on, uh, the, ne the next one. Um, yeah, um, I mean, Bob can probably explain it, the next one. Um, Bob can probably explain it better than I can, but I was looking at this slide earlier, and uh, what you were trying to do was to project at various levels of value that would be in the endowment, what the potential draw rate would be for each of the years, projecting out, which was one of the questions. You want me to speak? Yes, yeah. please uh, go ahead. Sean, could you bring Alicia back in from the audience? For some reason, she keeps getting kicked it out. There you go, thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, Sean. It's okay. I just can't do it while my screen share. I know. Okay. All right. The system by which we operate is an average of 12 quarters. Um, so that what I've done here, just to make it simpler for everybody to read it, is if you just look at the average values for each of the years, um, the first three numbers of av average value, which is 7.5, 8.0, and 7.9, those first three years um, are actually looked at in the following year, in 2020 in that case, and they then are used as the basis for the value in the following year after that, which is 2021. So what happens in all of these things is that there is a lag of two years between the dollar values that are shown uh, and when that shows up as a value of the uh, draw of 4%, if we look at it and we say, this is not enough, or there is some program we want to add, then occasionally we have been willing to add to that. Um, if you go back you know, to the early 2010s, uh, um, then it frequently was over 5%, but the policy was changed and it was said, let us keep to 4% wherever we can. So um, if you now look at, for example, the last three numbers, which would be 7, 9, 9, 2, and 8, 2, um, those average out to a number, which is the 2024 number, which is 351, 497. I know what that will be for next year, even though we're still in 2023 and we have not yet spent any of that, and we have not drawn it yet. So that tells you how the system works. And so when I looked at uh, what the values might be going forward, just as a simplification, the first set of numbers shows 
the years 2023, 24, and 25 as $8 million each year as the value. Um, what that then does is it, in 2023's number, that gets averaged in with 22 and 21 to produce for the year 2025, a value of 352,493 as the draw. And the same thing would be true for the next year and the next year. After 2027, um, if it remained at $8 million, then the draw would be 320,000 for each year going forward. Uh, what the other numbers on this chart show is what happens if it is 6 million or 4 million or $2 million in the year 2023 or 2024 or 2025. Each of those is a number which, you know, obviously is not going to be the accurate number because there are differences in what the market does and consequently what the base number of, of the uh, portfolio is, what, what the value of the endowment is. It also depends upon whether we receive any gifts into the endowment. And it also depends upon whether uh, the costs change over time. So um, the purpose of this chart was to just give you a, a reasonably simple way of thinking about what the impact would be and how long it would be before you actually saw it. So the lowest number that I showed is if there was $2 million left in the endowment, and that would have an effect two years later of bringing the endowment value or the, the draw from the endowment down to 259 and then in the next year, when two years of $2 million is being used in the averaging per process, then we go down to 163. And if, if it remained there for three years in a row, it would go down to $80,000. Um, this is simpler than, than other ways of explaining it, but not simple. So I suspect people may have questions. Uh, Sharon? Yeah, I just wanted to comment um, uh, or highlight something that Kathy said. She was linking the draw with what the town appropriates. And, and the two are really very much not linked at all. I mean, un unless the town were to, for some reason, not give the library any appropriation, that would be a problem. But um, the the the, li the town appropriation to the library pays for salaries and the salaries that are not covered by the town appropriation are taken care of by our state aid. So it, it, it's not linked with the endowment at all. Thank you. Okay, but if you were to go back to exhibit A, And the purpose of this was to simplify some of the numbers and to make it a little easier to operate. So the first line is the total budget for each of those years, 2.5 million, 2.6 million, and so on. Then there is a municipal appropriation and state aid as it was drawn upon for that year. So it's basically a cash budget in terms of the way in which this functions. And the balance of the budget for that year was raised locally. Um, that comes basically out of two components. One is monies that we are given during that year, um, generally raised at this point by the Friends of the Jones Library, which at the bottom you see me abbreviating is FOJL. Um, but for the most part, what we're looking at are monies that are raised either directly by the library when we were doing all of the fundraising ourselves, but mostly it is what the friends have produced or have taken from their Woodbury fund. Uh, and that you can see has been rising over the years and we keep hoping that it will continue to rise. Um, what that then leaves in order to make the budget balance is money from the endowment plus some miscellaneous things, which I chose not to, to specify, but they are fines, they are um, uh, 
lost books which have to be replaced. There are lots of little things. The only major item in that is contributions that are made specifically to the special collection and that we keep uh, essentially separate from, from the rest of the budget. So uh, what you'll see is that the endowment makes up about 60 something, 63% on the average um, of all of the non-personnel, non-capital uh, improvement items that are not covered through the municipal appropriation. Uh, it is, that is where we get the money to buy books. This is where we get the money to participate in the statewide systems of exchanging the needs for books. That is where we get um, costs for heat and light and for insurance and every other expense that you can think of. So um, that is the $462,000 that is raised locally, of which 63% is raised through the endowment. And the Friends of the Jones Library, for the most part, raise essentially all the rest of it. Andy, do you want me to keep, do you want yeah. to stay with endowment or do you want me to, I just want to make sure we get through all the questions. Yeah, I um, think we need to go back to the questions. Okay. Um, Are there any final questions on in the endowment? I think none of us want to use the endowment for the purpose, you know, for the building project. I think that's yeah, where we're I, all at, so. I do have a question. Are there expenses in the that you use the endowment for that could, that are best paid for with that color of money versus town appropriation? And is that one of the reasons you separate that this way versus the other? No. Um, the endowment is the result of gifts to the library over a hundred year period. Um, some of them have been specified as being for particular purposes of that 8 million plus that we currently have, about 300,000 we basically cannot use for this purpose. The rest of it is, is subject to our decisions. Thank you. Michelle, has her hand up. I just I apologize if you already mentioned this, Andy, while we were in a brief recess, but um, I wanted to make it clear, especially for folks who are in the public, um, that the trustees, I think, had passed a motion to commit their endowment, which I believe was re reversed or taken off of the table at their meeting last night. Is that accurate or would somebody be able to just speak to that to clarify that piece? Sharon, Alex, you want to explain that? Sure. Um, so um, uh, the library trustees two meetings ago, I believe, um, voted a motion to enter into an agreement with the town, a new MOU, and to pledge the endowment. So not, there, there, has, there, there is no new agreement. There's only the existing agreement that we have um, that was approved by the town council um, back before the vote. Um, given another motion that was made in the meeting um, uh, around how to proceed, which I don't know structurally how people want to deal with this, but there was another motion that was made that gave uh, sort of a, a path forward that made sense given where we are in the project and what we know. And so the uh, prior motion to enter into an agreement to pledge the endowment was taken off the table to be revisited at a later time uh, when we get price certainty and know what the numbers might actually be once we know what fundraising is, once we have price certain, et cetera. And Andy, if I may just add, uh, uh, Michelle, thank you for asking that question. Uh, we uh, wanted to be very clear that in quote, rescinding this motion, this did not indicate anything about the trustee's willingness to do anything uh, about backstopping the town. In other words, this is not a like, we're taking it off the table, we don't wanna help, uh, quite the opposite. It was given this other motion that we, that we passed, we wanted to focus the attention of the town on what is right before us, which is getting us through the uh, construction bid phase. 
And then when we had a clear sense of what the needs are with the town, then we thought it would be more appropriate uh, to come forward and um, pledge uh, whatever the support is. And I just wanna make clear that I think there's a confusion um, in what it is that we're talking about in any of these MOUs. Uh, we are pledging to provide a financial support or backing to the town. That, that financial backing could come from a withdrawal from the endowment, or it could come from some other way in which the library raises funds. So when we've talked about, in the town council I heard last night, it was very, very instructive, very helpful discussion about, well, if they take this money out of the endowment, then how are they gonna maintain services? Well, that's one way of um, funding, uh, providing funding, but it is not the only way. Uh, for example, the library owns its own building and uh, maybe there could be borrowing against the value of the building. And then that would allow for a different form of repayment over time. So um, taking it back, taking this $8 million pledge, whatever it was back is not meant to say, we're not all in, we are all in. We just thought it would be more appropriate to, to deal with that commitment when the time came. All right, Andy, I was going to move on to the next section of questions, which is um, construction costs. So one thing Alex noted, just for those who were at the meeting last night, um, Alex didn't get updated numbers from the OPM in time for, or, or put this in before we got those updated numbers. Um, so the 46.4 number that was shared last night is sort of the OPM's new middle of the road estimate. Um, and there's a budget breakdown in the packet for how, how uh, he arrived at that number. Which makes I think A and C potentially wrong. So my apologies for that. Yeah, I mean, it's all- <laughs> Don't focus think, on A and C. I think the thing to say for all these, it's all a range at this point, right? So the midpoint is, you know, it's still an estimate. It's within the range um, until we open up construction bids. Uh, it, it'll always be an estimate, so. Uh, Andy, Lynn has her hand up. Lynn? Yes, yeah, since I asked question E, when and added it to the list. I want to be give an example. For example, in order to exhibit the um, Civil War tablets, I'm sorry. I just need to. Be oh, in order to exhibit the Civil War tablets, we could actually build the structure of the room, but not finish it per se. And that is the kind of thing, from my own experience with grants and contracts over any number of years, probably 50. Um, that's the kind of thing that's really attractive to fundraising. It's really attractive to grants. And the money from the grants would then be used to actually place the tablets, to hang them, to add additional things to that room. So when I asked this question, it wasn't to say the building wouldn't be able to be occupied. It was to say there might be pieces of the building for which funds could be raised over time, and that's an example of it. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I was just looking at um, the kind of discussion there about wiring and things like that. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I appreciate 
that, but you could wire these things during construction and then plug it in later. I mean, it, I, I wouldn't want to see a situation where you're having to open up walls or ceilings in order to add wiring later. But I think, you know, you one could wire things and, you know, put a plate there and then plug in at a later date. So I, I think thinking it through that way might be very helpful in terms of reducing initial costs. Thank you. Another way of uh, I, uh, dealing with the staging question that Lynn was kind of raising, whether you could stage expenses. Alex. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I, I definitely appreciate that comment. And I think we, we've already been thinking about that. You know, solar panels are a really easy wire for them. So um, that that will definitely be part of the conversation as we move into actual design and development. Um, and so I definitely will we'll look at that and definitely appreciate the comment. Kathy? I'm just going to raise a really minor point because I saw it when these estimated utility costs first came to us. I believe when you do the current building electric costs, you use a different price per kilowatt hour than when you do with a new building. And I would just like you to use the same price per hour. I don't care whether it's what you currently spend or what's projected. That's the way I'm used to seeing estimates. So I understand what was done, it's literally the budget. But for example, what we're doing with the school is saying, what are we currently spending per kilowatt hour? If we use this many kilowatt hours at those tents less, this is what we would send. So I think it's a little less than 8%. So just that original number was based, I think on two different cents per hour um, from two different sources. So it was, it was in the original chart. So it's the only reason I would even know this. So it's just a comment. It's it has almost nothing to do with the amount of money we're talking about. <laughs> All right, we're moving to the fundraising section. If that that was actually corrected, Kathy, in the second. Um, so it it has been corrected now. Yeah, the first packet had, and then we went back to the second packet um, from what last finance committee meeting, and then we actually in that chart also added an update if we were to use one hundred percent renewable energy. So that was in the second one. Okay, so it had renewable because originally it was always an eight percent savings. So I just okay, thanks. And, and, and the numbers change because when we did it again later, it was different numbers, but it didn't okay. want you know what I mean because energy costs had changed. But that was corrected. So the numbers that you're so this does not reflect renewable energy. Um, but the last, the second chart that we did for you did update it and did include okay. it as an option. Okay, it's thanks. Just not. Yep, no problem. Bob? You're muted, You're muted, Bob. You're muted, Bob. You could just scroll back just a little bit. Um, the question is what items have been dropped from the scope? And it's, I think, important to just realize that among the uh, <clears throat> uh, value engineering items that have been changing and some items which not everybody has been aware of, um, among the changes are possibly the, the elimination of the sawtooth structure, uh, which are designed to let in light on one side and to mount uh, solar panels on the other side. Solar panels apparently have never been in the design as, as it currently stands. So those were to be wow. an add-on subsequently. Um, and so uh, what we're now talking about is essentially a flat roof for most of it with no penetrations except along one line, which will be um, a, a skylight. And the other piece that has, uh, I think, changed is that uh, in trying to do the value engineering, a lot of the ceiling treatments have changed substantially so that in some areas it is, uh, I believe, acoustical tire, 
oh, excuse, excuse me, acoustic tiles. Uh, and in other areas, it will be exposed so that you can see up to the actual um, wood uh, structure at, uh, which makes up the, the roof um, and possibly some of the piping just as a, uh, as a design feature so that you see it. So if you think about the Drake, uh, where as in many uh, loft uh, redevelopments, you can see areas of the, the piping and such, which is in the ceiling. I believe some of that has been incorporated into the, the value engineering. Yeah, there's a, I think the list is attached, isn't it, Sharon, of all the, the value engineering. Um, and, and and also the, the building committee has talked about it the last two meetings. Um, can I, yeah, so so to, to clarify and, um, and Kathy can correct me, but so this question originally came from Kathy last week, and it's a different question. What she was asking was, hey, when we got the first cost estimate back in 2016, in order to balance the budget, you had to make some cuts. So at that point, the project cost stayed the same, but some cuts were made. And so that's what I'm referring to here. I would need more time to get the exact figures, but that's what this is. That's separate from the value engineering that's coming in a different question. I also wanted to clarify something that Bob said. So the solar panels were included in our project um, for up until 2020, for some reason, reason or another they they got dropped during cost estimations but um i just wanted to clarify that thank you austin um i also want to clarify uh just as a member of the building committee the uh recommendation of the building committee to remove the sawtooth tooth roof design was made after repeated assurances from the architects that this would not affect the ability to install solar panels on the building. Okay. Kathy? Um, I, know, I know we're gonna get to those items later, but does it affect the light in the building? Um, how much daylight comes through because one of the things I liked about it is it looked like it's suffused the hallways with light, you know, so it, it, that's just a question. And skylights are, we have them in our slate roof. Uh, they leak, um, you know, because they're flat, you know, as opposed to the sawtooth design, which I think would have protected. So I just had a question about daylight inside. To response there. Austin, do you want to respond to that directly? Uh, sure. The answer is that uh, uh, the building committee is very much aware of this. Uh, we had a discussion with the architects. Um, we were assured that there are other ways of getting the daylight in. Um, MBLC, we're told, is not in favor of the normal skylighting because they are very much aware of leakage. And there's nobody who's been associated with the Jones Library that is not aware of leakage problems. <laughs> so, uh, Kathy, it's a great question. We asked it of the architects. We've been assured that this will not lead to a diminishment of the um, natural light that will come into the library. They're just going to have to look for other ways to do it without using the traditional skylight design. So we're going into the fundraising sections. Sorry, I'll turn that off. Kathy, um, do you have a question on this section? Yeah, I was going to have said. Yeah, my, my question is just, I want to make sure I'm reading it right. New 
is a is you're hopeless, correct? Uh, additional committed is you have a pledge, something in writing. Am I reading that? And then cash. Well, I think cash means you have it. So if I go through those columns, is that the correct way to read it? The yeah. the new yeah. is where new is where where what the aspiration is. Yes, that's what we would hope to raise. We would expect to raise going forward. Okay. And and then the only other one on cash received the the three hundred thousand bequest was that specific to the capital campaign or was that a bequest that was open ended that came in and then you could move it into the, this project? Sharon, Sharon can verify, but my understanding is yes. There's two in there, one for 276,000 and another for another 25 and change. And both of them were at the discretion of the trustees. And the first one, the 276,000 has been allocated to the project. The other one has not yet been voted uh, pending, uh, you know, the, what's going on now. Thank you. Sharon's hand is up, Andy, or whoever is calling on people. Andy, I can see him on the top. Do you want me to call on people as our hand pops up? Yeah, yeah, present. Sharon. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there are one, two, three different bequests that the trustees have voted to put into um, into this project. So that's what that is. Um, again, a clarification. Um, what, what we have voted is that to the extent that, that it is needed for funding the project, those uh, are in the endowment, but will be withdrawn for that purpose if as and when needed. Alicia. You're muted. Uh, thank you. Um, so my question is for the new column, um, when will we know whether or not those have been confirmed? Well, there's a huge variety in there that um, confirmation of which would come at different times. We hope to know, we expect to know about a $1.1 million federal earmark this fall. Um, we expect to hear about the result of a $1 million National Endowment for the Humanities grant application next spring, I believe. Um, the historic tax credits, we won't know until nearly the end of the construction process, and we wouldn't receive the money until after the project is finished. Um, the mass save MOU, Sharon knows a little more about that than, than maybe Alex also, um, than I do. And the others would be as we go along. I mean, we, as soon as we know we have a clear field here, uh, well, as soon as we know we're what the layout's gonna be, we're gonna start talking to corporations and banks about naming opportunities. And we would expect those to come in over the next few years. I think I did for Sean a phased a annual. Has that been distributed yet? I mean, again, it's kind of this is uh, best uh, estimation. It's probably about as good as the estimation of the total cost of the building. Um, it, it, but it, I, those the phasing of those new gifts is I did outline in more detail on something I provided Sean. Yeah, if it's not in the packet, we can add it to the packet. I, I wasn't okay. sure if it was in. It is in the packet. It is, okay. Um, and, and in particular, what right. we would what we would know Did by... Did you say that I'm not, you're breaking up, Alicia. I'm not hearing... Alicia, do you want to try to ask your question again? 
Yeah, and, and make sure. Sorry, I was just trying to confirm. Um, Sean, you said that those details were in the packet. Yeah, the, uh, Lynn said they they are in the packet. Um, I can. Okay. Um, do you can guys you want me? To, I can point. pull it up if um, people want to look at that. That'd be, that'd be awesome. That Thank you. Uh, attachment I, Sean. Is it? Oh, is it already in there? Um, That's it. Or that one. That one's even better. So what we requested was a breakdown of a plan and with um, amounts that could be raised and sort of the, the key decision points. So um, there's sort of an annual amount to be raised that can provide it, but also a number at um, key points. So um, I'm not sure what 9-1-2023, that might've been the original construction bid date, but we're more, uh, the latest timeline has us closer to the December 31st. 2023 timeline. So, um, okay, yes, that's what I was using. That okay. September date is the day you would know a, a contract price. Okay, so we're going to be closer to this. So the way I okay. interpret this is, yes, um, we would look to see if we're around the 6.3 million dollar number yes. when we go to open up uh, bids. Yes, that would be our goal. Bob and Alex have their hands. Uh, yeah, I do. I was just about to say that Bob, Alex, and Michelle all have their hands. You do too, Lynn. Bob? Um, just as a point of information, um, this is one scenario. Uh, it is not the only, and uh, my own version of this is Exhibit H which uh, produces a somewhat different total. Um, this one is based upon a $43 million project. Um, I've redone mine to a $47 million project and that still leaves a gap of about $6 million. Alex? Thanks, yeah, I just wanna clarify. Um, so on the historic tax credits in terms of timing, so applications for the tax credits are typically made throughout construction, but um, our historic tax credit consultant, so we have Epsilon, uh, which uh, people who were previously part of finance and <clears throat> council might remember that's all these people do, this is their profession. Um, but they said that we could start applying for them during divine, design development as well. And so, when we are applying for them, uh, we are simultaneously seeking investment. So even though it wouldn't be paid until potentially 60 days after um, certificate, certificate of occupancy, there is a possibility that we will know some of the historic tax credits because they're applied for over several cycles. We'll be, we will be applying the entire process. So it's possible that some of those might be known. Um, again, that's a possibility, so. Well, almost certainly we'll know uh, it's what amount is committed before December 31, 26, because we'll be applying all along. When you get the certificate, you know what it is. What you can sell it for is another question, what the discount is, but that's pretty stable. Right, and, exactly. Um, and by the way, the number, the 1.8 million I put in there doesn't reflect the, um, in the es escalation in the cost of the historic preservation work that's being done, which is now estimated, I think over two and a half, uh, 12 and a half million, 20% of which would be two and a half million. So I did it bump it up a little bit from the 1.6 we were talking about before, but I've estimated on the conservative side. This, is, I, I sh yes, this will not match Bob's projection. He's only interested in cash as a good treasurer should be. These are commitments. This is what you'll, you can be sure that you'll receive. Lynn? Yeah, um, fundraising is scary, but having done some in this community, um, a smaller amount and looking at some other fundraising, I actually am more comfortable with this than I thought I would be. And I, 
I want to share that. And the reason, and the thing I want to also share is that as you raise money, you attract regular donors. And those regular donors often come back on capital campaigns, but they then also come back <clears throat> on your regular annual campaign. And I can just share my own personal experience from the Survival Center and say that our annual campaigns now are much, much more robust than they were before our capital campaign because we picked up donors along the way. So I not only do this is over a much longer period of time, it's for more money, but people tend to give annually. And um, I think that this fundraising is scary, but I'm more comfortable with this than I ever thought I would be. Thank you. Question? Thank you, Andy. Um, I just wanted to say that the trustees uh, have seen this projection and I think I can speak for the majority of the trustees on this. Uh, we're quite comfortable with this projection. And past performance is no guarantee of future whatever, but past performance is a, a good place to put your bet when you're taking a risk on something. So what is the past performance? Uh, we have an extraordinary fundraising committee led by two extraordinary fundraisers that have a demonstrated track record of success in high dollar fundraising. Kent made his living uh, working um, in a place where high dollar fundraising was the thing to do. And the second thing is look at what they've already done. Now again, that's no guarantee what will happen. And then the other thing that I think it might be important for people to hear, Kent can say it, it's not for me to say, is what Kent's experience has been in fundraising for worthy projects. And um, we think this is a very worthy project in, so to speak, good times and bad. Kent, is there anything you can say about the likely effect of this move in the you know, stock market went down today, stock market goes up? It's never a good time for fundraising in the eyes of donors being approached. But I can say that I have worked through 1990, uh, 2008, um, and they're ephemeral. They do pass. And people, these campaigns are going to I be, mean, we're talking about going out five years here. And um, uh, it, it can be done. And I, the thing that, that I think daunts most people is the notion that there are people who could make multi-million dollar gifts who live in Amherst. This is a town, this is an academic town full of academics. And I would just remind you that two things, uh, the town has just received a gift for a million and a half dollars for the North Amherst Library anonymously, but I have to assume it's an Amherst resident. Um, when I was the president of the Community Foundation, we received a million, this is 15 years ago, we received a million dollar charitable lead trust, which is a complicated arrangement that is done only by very wealthy people who have more money than they can use and want to get it to their heirs at as low a tax cost possible. One of the $2 million lead trusts, we received two of the $2 million lead trusts. I forgot the other one came from residents of Amherst. There's, there are people of means out there quietly, and um, I think this is this is plausible, definitely plausible. Okay, Michelle, you've been so concerned. Thank you. Um, I had just wanted to ask a clarifying question, and then also make a comment about my experience uh, with fundraising. Um, so the question I have is, uh, let's fast forward, the bids come in and uh, we open them up and uh, we see we see what the project is going to actually cost. And then we have several years after that that we have to, to meet our goal of fundraising, right? So still at the point of knowing what the actual cost is going to be, we'll still have half or more of this to, to raise. Is that correct? Yes. 
I, I would just say that this is that cash flow is a different problem than ultimate net. And remember, this doesn't include the 2.7 million you're going to receive from the MBLC as each year as you go along, as well as if all of these receipts. So I can't, it would be impossible to predict the cash flow. And some of it will indeed overhang the final uh, opening of the building. Um, and it may be that some part of the endowment has to be used to bridge that gap. It may be some of the town's bond funding bridges that gap. I, that's not an unimportant problem, but on the other hand, it's nothing like the problem of, well, ultimately, are you going to have enough to pay the bills in the end? Michelle, for our planning purposes, we assume all the fundraising comes at the end. Um, mm -hmm. So when we're looking at the bigger plan for all the building projects, the fun, um, except for the money that we have in hand, which we do have some in hand currently, um, we'll assume it comes at the end for cash flow purposes and just for, for financing purposes. Okay, thank you. And I, I so I wanted to just offer a little mm -hmm. bit of experience that I've had in the community. I was the chair of the capital campaign for the Amherst Montessori School Building. And um, it was a small campaign, I think uh, $650,000. So um, most of it was financed locally. Um, but what I can say is it was, and, and of course that was a limited pool of people in some ways because we were really pulling from uh, current and past um, families that attended the school. But as the school was starting to be built and the excitement was building, it was really, it was quite amazing to see how many people rallied and supported the fundraising efforts. And so I think that's important for us to remember is that it, this is a big, scary number. I, I'm, <laughs> I have to be honest. Um, but when the work starts to happen and people start to see, wow, this is actually, um, you know, coming to fruition and and be able to follow it. And I can see right here at the North Amherst Library. I drive by it every day, and I'm seeing the building process beginning, and it's it's super exciting. Um, I also wanted to say that. We live in a community that has a lot of significance. It has a lot of significant people, a lot of significance just historically. And so we can draw on those um, really awesome aspects about our community. So it's not just necessarily about raising funds from individual residents in our community, which we mm -hmm. hope to be able to do, but it's also really um, leveraging those connections and, and, and those accomplishments within our community that we have. Um, and I, I found personally in my experience that those can be very positive as well. So I just wanted to add that to the thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alicia? Um, thank you. I just wanted to share that. So the details that are coming from the conversation that we are having for me is a lot more helpful than the document that is on the screen in front of us. Um, so, and I do respect that the trustees did an incredible amount of work to get us to our meeting today. Um, but it is helpful to have like what we were just talking about, the things that Kent and I think Alex just went over in terms of like dates and specific funds. Those things build me a much more clear picture than this document that we have here. So I just wanted to let that be known. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, Kathy. Um, I, I, I agree with Alicia, it's, it's terrific. You've pulled together this information for us, but I wanna go back to who's at risk. Um, that was the big discussion when we were at 36 million um, and the uh, MOU we had plus your endowment looked like if, looked like the fundraising was really pretty doable at that point, Kent, you know, and the various pieces and the, the endowment could be at least partially at risk you know, for a two or three year period um, with things coming in toward the end. I think we're talking about, um, and Sean hasn't done the math for us, which he did when we looked at the 36 million. We have to finance the whole thing um, if, if we say go. 
which means we as a town go out for 49 million, 50 million, whatever the number is. And we could use the high number, the low number, and we'll know the real number. Then as the fundraising comes in, if, if it doesn't come all the way in, um, I think we, the town, is at risk for the money because um, uh, it's it's more than the total endowment right now. The you know so it's not just maybe a couple million. So I just I just want to um, I think the table is very helpful, but seeing that rear end, uh, I think you've done a terrific job raising money, and I I wasn't believing you could hit the five. And it, I now believe you could hit the five, seeing where you are now. Um, but it's another, it's a huge stretch. Um, so I just want to, I think we're going to need, Sean, what does that mean if we go out and we start talking? The other thing was when we were looking at this, we were, we used, a, we used the best interest rate we could at that point, And we had better interest rates to be using. Um, so we were in. Sean, you'll know this. We were in the 2% or 3% range um, for a 20 year, 30 year. So I don't know what this now looks like in the world we're in. We're, we're facing this with the school and all of our, um, anything we're doing right now, our, our fire ladder truck, <laughs> both the thing costs more money and the, the debt costs more money. So it's not just the million dollars, but it's the million dollars times 4% or times whatever. So I would really like to not, necessarily today, but I would like our finance team um, to tell us what kind of risk we're talking about to the town. And I know, Bob, you didn't vote with the rest of the trustees. And to the extent I could read what you've written so far or see the thing, it was because of the financial risk. It wasn't a, a vote on the project per se. And that was, it's always been my concern, the financial risk to the town. So that. I just I just want to say that when I look at that, where we think we'll be in 2023, by the middle of it, when the bids come in, and if the kind of costs we're talking about come in, we'll be lucky if they're at the low end. Um, we'll be even luckier if they're below your low end, but they might be at the high end. And just so people know, on our little North Amherst library, that was an easy fundraising because one anonymous donor gave all the money. But first it was $800,000, then it was 1.2, then it was 1.8. Um, and we were really fortunate that they just dug deeper. But it was one person having so much invested in the project. But it was astonishing how much it went for 1,100 or 1,200 square feet. You know, it wasn't it wasn't ever super big. So I just that's what I'm worried about is the, the risk to the town um, and then the risk to the health of the library, too, because you, you as you peel things away, um, if you take some things away that you really wanted in the project, that was one of the things we did to this 1993 expansion that I think got us into some trouble. <laughs> so we don't want to. I know you're trying not to, you know, we don't want to hurt the bones of the project. Um, but I also don't want to see um, things we thought weren't going to come to the, the capital side of town with annual requests that we thought were in the project start three years from now. We suddenly mm -hmm. have a capital request because you either don't have furniture, you don't have some equipment you really need and wanted. And that's the kind of thing Bob was talking about. It could always be plugged in later, <laughs> you know, but it's, we don't have a, we have a capital plan that is so tight <laughs> to maintain buildings and roads without another draw. Um, so that's my bigger picture is the whole town. Um, in this context. So I just want to say, as Lissa said, it's good to hear this, but when I look at 23, 23 and beyond and think, meanwhile, if, if it's a go and these costs come in where we think they're coming in and you don't get the federal money or you don't get any one of those biggies, okay, then it's on the town because we can't, we can't pull back. Um, so, so I'll stop. And can I respond quickly to that? Yeah, I was going to ask you actually. Um... Yeah, so um, so Kathy, 100% agree with everything you said. I think that's exactly what Paul and I are certainly thinking about, or is the financial health of the town. Um, 
and the library because they are linked and how they support the library's operating budget, right? Um, so we will have an updated financing plan uh, where we are waiting for the project manager who was waiting for us to give him sort of a timeline for when this decision will be made, whether to move into the next phase. I've given him a tentative date um, for modeling purposes. So now he's going to model the cash flow going forward. Um, and once we have that model, we will be able to do a new financing plan and show what the what the higher costs are um, with the new interest rates and things like that. Um, for the you know all the reasons you described is why we're having this conversation and why we're we're looking at an amendment to the MOA that again to provide some assurances to the town. Um, there, there will be some, another, at least one other decision point or stopping point should the town decide to move forward at this point. There will be at least one other stopping point for the town to, again, reevaluate where it is when it opens up construction document, uh, construction bids. Um, and at that point, we'll also be able to look at the fundraising or along the way, we'll be able to look at the fundraising, but we'll be able to evaluate the fundraising efforts at that point. Um, which is why it was so helpful um, that Kent provided that plan. I think we still have to evaluate, you know, is that enough? Do we feel confident that that's the amount we should have at that point. Um, but it is helpful having that plan because now we have a number to look to when we open up bids to say, are we on track or not? Um, and that would be another another decision point for the council. Thank you. I actually was gonna ask you to talk a little bit about decision points. I'm glad you did. Ken. Uh, yes, I, I just, oh, can you hear me out? I, it's, these numbers are so daunting that it's very hard to avoid thinking about this in an all or nothing way. Uh, when in fact, I think the risk needs to be evaluated on a graduated basis. So if we're confident we can raise the 6.6, .6, then the gap is a full $8 million if the bids come in at the lower bid. What is the risk that we would raise nothing more? Well, I would, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this because I love the library. <laughs> I wouldn't want to see anything happen to this library that would, in the long run, uh, jeopardize it. So, uh, so let's is the prospect of our raising four million more than the six point six is that minimal? Also, what is the because of then that brings you if you take Bob's projections within a, a what is a hundred and sixty thousand dollar deficit? Well, uh, one hundred and twenty five thousand, well, fifty thousand dollar deficit for one year and the operating expenses. And what, as Lynn points out, what is the effect of uh, annual fund which we've raised? And you have the numbers, by the way, on the growth of that annual fund, which demonstrates not only the extent to which the town wants to support this library and its operations, but how much we can capitalize on that. So I think it, it really is important to think about this in a, in, a in a graduated risk way. Yes, there is certainly a point at which it makes no sense going forward. But I think there's also a point at which it makes all the sense in the world to go forward because the chances of raising nothing more are really minimal. And to answer Alicia's earlier request, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's always unclear to me what kind of information people want. I've been doing this kind of thing for 40 years. I can talk for hours. I used to give classes on how to fundraise. Anybody who wants to talk more about some of these details, I'd be delighted to do it. Thank you. Austin? So I appreciate Kathy's uh, focus. Uh, it's very helpful to me. I want to say quick three things. First of all, what have we learned so far in the fundraising? One thing we've learned so far in the fundraising is that we found sources of funding that we did not know existed several months ago. So we, you know, there are downside risks to fundraising, but there are also upside possibilities. And we've already seen that fund, funding that we didn't know would be possible for us. So maybe as we go forward, we will discover new sources of funds. Second point, and this is just to reemphasize what Sean said. I think the question that I hope we're going to focus on is what risk is there to the town in moving from now to construction bids? And I hope that what the library trustees will have said is as clear as we can say it, is we wanna work with the town to ensure that there is no risk to the town of going forward to construction bids. And that's why I said what I said earlier, we've gotta be very careful. We keep talking about dipping into the endowment. That's one source of funding. Bob Pam very helpfully reminded everybody in this town 
that at every phase in the construction of this library, library resources have been invested. In the original building, that was the purpose of the endowment. In the 1960s edition, the library helped fund that. In the 1990s edition, the libraries helped fund it. So uh, this is not an unprecedented thing that we're thinking about doing. It's a very highly precedented thing. In fact, it's what Samuel Maynard Jones wanted for his endowment, that it be used to build and support a library. So I think that uh, we, we hope that we can get to a point where counselors will feel comfortable that to get to construction bids, there is no real risk to the town and that we can get to construction bids. And if the library has to finance that um, activity, the library can do it using sources of funds that will be available to the library, which include, but are not limited to its endowment in a way that will not sacrifice the operating needs of the library. Okay, uh, thank you. I see four more hands up and I'd, I'd then like to uh, evaluate where we are and to um, sort of get our path forward, but Lynn? I wanna thank Michelle for sharing the story of the Montessori school because she's right. People walk in with checks because they see structures happening. The second thing I wanna do is I wanna actually go out five years. Suppose five years from now, we're still 4 million away. We still own a billion, a, a building that we haven't put a mortgage on. We can refinance town debt. Yes, that costs money. Yes, we don't want to do those things. But it's not like the bank is going to come and shut the town down. It's also not like we can't make other decisions along the way about our other capital needs. So I wanna make sure, because for me, I don't wanna be sitting here a year and a half from now and pulling the plug. I wanna make sure that we can go forward and we can continue to go forward. And so I'm always looking about where are your assets and how can you solve that problem? That's my only comment. We're going to go to Bernie because he hasn't had the opportunity today yet. Bernie? Hey, thanks, Andy. I, I just want to make note that my uh, I'm getting a little error message here that my uh, internet connection is unstable. So if I disappear, it's the internet and not me. Um, the, the value in going forward to construction uh, bids and getting those bids out and opened is that it gives uh, a certainty to what we're up against. It ends the speculation. At that point, we know what we have to do. We know what the situation is. I think that's also at the point where it's gonna encourage people who are um, thinking about giving to the project uh, to donate. Because again, it's people don't like to spend money on pure or give money on pure speculation uh, they like to know that there's going to be, uh, a, there's a definitive plan and there's going to be an outcome. And that shows in a variety of ways in terms of municipal finance. And, and so I, I think by um, get, working with the library trustees to try to find a way to uh, alleviate some of the anxiety around the town being on the hook between now and construction bids is, is, is the way to go. I, I think we need to have certainty here. We need to know what we're getting and what's it going to cost, and then people can come forward, and and they will. Um, I'd also like to point out that this isn't the only project uh, in the state or in the country uh, that's been impacted and threatened by the present situation. And I'm I'm hopeful. And uh, Mindy, I know you're out in the audience. So I've got great faith in you, um, and Joe Camerford. And the fact that we can build a network among other towns who are impacted like this to either get the Commonwealth to be a little more generous in its funding or to be more flexible in its design standards to loosen up on those formulas. So that's another prospect that really needs to be explored. Um, and that is better explored if we are looking at co certain costs as opposed to speculative costs. So that's my that's my two cents. I'll get off the soapbox now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michelle. 
Just a couple more comments. Um, first, I just, I, I, one of the things that I keep hearing is, well, let's get to this um, next step of getting the bids and knowing what our actual costs are. And I think that's really obviously an important milestone for us. But in some ways, I feel like if we're committing to this, it's a deeper process for us. It's not like that this is so fragile that we get to the next, you know, milestone and, and get and, and and we're gonna pull the plug to use your words, Lynn. Um, you know, because I think that it's about committing and honoring what the community has asked for. And I totally get that there was a different price tag uh, that the community was voting at that time. But in my mind, I just, I guess I want to sort of shift to a bit of a deeper thinking about, not that we're not, I'm not saying we're not thinking deeply, but like a deeper, deeper commitment um, and uh, some unity among the trustees and the town councilors in that commitment. And like, if we're going forward, we're all fundraising, we're all out there, we're all part of this process in a way. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is looking at the MOU, and please correct me if I get any of this wrong, but it, uh, I realized that the library owns and just building on what Lynn and Austin were talking about earlier, the library owns the land, I believe. And does the library also own the building? And so the library owns the building and the land. Okay. And I just pulled up the property card. Um, there's a $20 million assessment on it. Um, and that really just like opened my eyes to, you know, the fact that there are other opportunities, I'm sure out there that the library may be able to consider uh, other funding opportunities. And just curious if um, any of the local banks have been involved in this process or have conversations have been had. I know um, the Amherst Montessori School used Greenfield Savings Bank. We do have excellent local banks um, and partners here. So $20 million assessment, and that I'm sure is not even close to really what that land and what that property is worth. So I encourage us to really think about that as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Alicia? Um, thank you. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first one is to Sean, um, if that you will be presenting to us the updated for project model before our decision has to be made? Uh, no, I don't think we'll have the information in time. I mean, it depends when you wanna make the decision, but um, given we're trying to make the trying to make a decision yes or no pretty soon so that the um the designers and the opm can move forward I, I don't think we'll have that information in time okay um thank you so what i think i think it would be actually extremely helpful to have um that information before we make the decision i know you're saying that it might not be possible but um i think it would be helpful to see again i think i asked for this at the last meeting what the effect to the town's budget and the operating budget would be if the fundraising was not met. Um, and I think along the lines of what Kent was talking about in terms of like, we're not gonna have a zero fundraising. So like we don't have to take into consideration what would happen if there was like no fundraising met, but maybe if we could have a model that looks at like, the trustees met 25% of fundraising or the trustees met 50% of fundraising or they met 75% of fundraising and how those changes would affect the town's operating budget moving forward. I think that is like a critical piece of information for this project. Can I respond to that, Andy? Sure. So I think if there's specific scenarios um, that are requested, we could try to work on that. I'll say the 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 scenarios are endless um, because they're, it, it's estimates on top of estimates in terms of we don't know interest rates right now and when we were going to go out to borrow. Um, we don't know the fundraising and how much will come in. We don't know uh, the cost for the other building projects that we haven't developed um, further along. So again, we can provide, you know, sort of our, again, a model or, or you know, a, a different scenarios, um, but it's, I don't think it's going to necessarily provide assurances in any way that it, um, to, to make somebody feel better about it. Um, 
and so again, we can I, we can push the OPM to get us the cash flow information, you know, hopefully this week, and then our financial advisor would take it from there and probably take another few days to get it. Um, so we might be able to have it for the nineteenth um, potentially, but I can't guarantee it. Uh, thank you, Sean. That would be helpful if that is possible. Um, and it's not necessarily for assurance, but I think just for realistic expectations. And so that we can see, like, even if we don't have all of the minute details and we have a general idea of what the trend would be. So like, you know, again, like I said, 25 versus 50 versus 75, um, you know, like, is it going to be a huge difference for the town operating budget if the trustees meet 90% of their fundraising and we're on the line for the 10%? I don't know, but if I knew, that would be very helpful for me. So it depends. I, I think that's a good question. It depends again what happens if they don't make their fundraising. So if they don't make their fundraising and it comes from, um, as Austin said, some Jones uh, Trustees Inc. source, whether it be the endowment or a mortgage, um, and the town share stays the same, uh, the fifteen point eight. The only impact we're looking at right now would be just the fact that we're going to have to have higher um, temporary financings because the project costs more. And so we're going to be borrowing more on a temporary basis that would ultimately be repaid. Um, if the fundraising comes up short and there is no mechanism for the for that fundraising to be made up by the, the trustees and it has to come out of the town funding, then that would be a different picture going forward. That would impact our, you know, the amount of money that we set aside for capital. Um, it could impact operations if there's a decision to allocate more funds to capital. So again, there's there's lots of scenarios. So I, again, if, if you want to send specific scenarios or if the council wants to send specific um, sort of uh, options to look at, we can certainly uh, work on that. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, because I think even the scenario that you were just talking about where they end up covering it with the endowment and we're just on the line for the borrowing amount, which is higher in the beginning and it's temporary, it would still be helpful to see literally how that temporarily will affect our, bu our budget versus the other scenarios. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to recognize the other two people who have hands up right now, and then I want to stop and work with all of you to figure out a path for the rest of the meeting because we're um, really getting to a stuck point um, and we have a lot to go through and we haven't done public comment yet and we need to get to a conclusion of today. So, um, Kathy. Okay, I, I'll try to be brief. Um, and first part is just building on Alicia's request, Sean. In, in the budget you gave us for the capital plan, you have a last page, as you know, that it's really terrific for the the, the cost of the debt that we're financing for the big project. So there's a line called Jones in there. So I think at a minimum, looking out five years, 10 years, that if we're having to take on 49 million with that cash flow, you know, even with the most optimistic that we're early on because with an interest rate. So just something focused on that. But I, I want to just say that when the voters, when this went out to vote, because I know many people in my district who were really positive about the project, what they told me is it's not competing with the other three projects because the finance director in the town, which we totally, we totally trust, <laughs> um, has told us all four are possible. And here's the modeling that showed it. And I realized that the world uh, stood on its head after that in a shocking way, a kind of a terrifying way. But there was this sense that um, the library in no way was bumping up against the aspirations for a school, for example. Um, and that this and the school now is more expensive for the same reasons the library is more expensive. Everything costs more. So so I just want to be protective of um, what everyone thought they were voting on. And if um, I realize we've got these two stopping points, but this is very much interactive with uh, what are we telling taxpayers? Um, I, I keep worrying that people think we've got this bottomless pocket where somehow we can fund the Crest program, we can fund firefighters. It's miraculous because we didn't have them before. And now we can still go ahead with four projects, all of which are more expensive than they were before. 
and the what you showed us in July was terrifying. It it didn't it looked like it just doesn't work, um, and it was iffy a year ago. You know, it was tight is what we talked about tight if all of this works. So I just at, at a minimum on the Jones line, I, I think, is to show us the the what if the what if all things go swimmingly. What if there's a shortfall in the fund rising beyond what we originally thought and we're on the hook for it? And then I do understand what Austin said that we're saying if we go to the point of getting construction bids, we put out 1.8 to 1.2 million and the trustees can hold the town hall, will commit to holding us whole. That's great, you know, but then we're going to have to make that decision then in June or July of next year. So the more we can understand what the decision might look like, the better in terms of the impact. Because it's there's a big difference between 49, 50 million and 36. Um, so it, I wish it was only a $1 million difference, um, something nice and tidy and small. I'm sure you you all do too. So that's it. Just I think at least that one line, because I know the other lines, DPW line is bigger now, fire station line is bigger now. They're all bigger than what we saw probably even in July. <laughs> so thank you. Bob? I'll try to be brief. Um, two points. Um, the library has signed deed restrictions which say that it shall remain a library for the next 30 years. Um, and consequently, if you go to a bank and you say, put a mortgage on this, they have no recourse because they can't then take possession and sell it for some other use. So just, just to be clear, that really does not exist as an alternative, as an option. Um, the second point that I would make is simply that um, I and many others have made contributions towards this project. Um, in the event that we go forward uh, and it is then uh, ended in a year or a year and a half or whenever it turns out to occur, I would not expect to get any money back. I would expect that that would remain as a contribution. And I would hope that other donors who have made such contributions and who are now pushing for this project to go forward would make similar kinds of commitments in whatever form they think is appropriate. But, you know, it is, it seems strange to me that there are people who have provided money and who have said, keep going, uh, knowing what the risks are at this point, have not made clear that they are willing to just um, at least leave in whatever money they have contributed to date, whether that means that they would continue or not. Okay, that's, that's my feeling on that. Thank you. Michelle, um, is it quick? Because I really want to. It's a very quick follow up. Yeah, I, I did see that um, the restriction in the MOU, and I was, that was, it looked like it was in reference to the CPA funds, which is what, a million dollars. So is that what you just said, Bob? I was curious about that. Um, are you definitively saying that borrowing from a bank is not an option or? Because I'll leave that to other people who are lawyers to, to say that, but I can't imagine that a bank is going to say, here is a mortgage where the, their security is the ability to take it and to sell it. And if, if it must remain as the town library for the next 30 years, it's a little hard to see why they would do that. And it must remain that way because of the CPA money. That's where the restriction originates from, or is Lynn, it just Lynn is Lynn is facing this, so let's let her answer the question. Actually, before before Lynn does, I actually spoke with a rep our representative from Vanguard today, uh, and this is exactly what he suggested, Michelle. He suggested that we could uh, approach a local bank who would possibly lend us that one point five million, and they would use the endowment as the collateral, not the building of the property. So yes, Michelle, it is doable. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, we kind of got into fundraising and historical tax credits and then have spent a lot of time really venturing around on topics that were related to that and coming from that. Um, 
and there were other things that uh, we that were further down in the questions list that um, we haven't been able to address, including some of the construction costs and things like that. I do feel that we need um, to uh, see if there's public comment. And, I, th and um, I would like to see if, I think that Lynn has um, shared with me earlier that she's been thinking about a possible motion. So I wanna uh, make sure that we uh, can, can move along in some sort of orderly fashion to not spend the rest of the night on this topic after a late night last night. Uh, are there other topics within the question list that um, any members of the committee felt uh, were important and didn't get the attention yet that they would like? Um, okay, seeing that no one has yet raised their hand, um, is there anything else, Austin or um, Sharon, that, or any of the trustees that you'd like to say further? <laughs> Excuse me, an explanation of last night's motion. Uh, it could be put on the screen if it would be helpful. But if you think it's important that we fully understand the motion, I want to make sure that there's that opportunity. Thank you, Andy. I'll just say the following. Uh, we're, we're incredibly grateful uh, for the attention of the Finance Committee. We really have been uh, very grateful for the work that Sean and Paul and Lynn have done with us. Um, it's been exemplary. Uh, there's been a lot of talk over the last few days of the town and the library. And I appreciate why that talk has occurred that way, but we are partners in this. Um, and uh, we've worked very hard for a very long time to establish a working relationship where it's not the town versus the library. And whatever we do, we wanna make sure that that partnership is kept in place. Andy, I'm sorry to be filibustering. About the motion, I wanted to be clear that the, what the trustees did was to um, approve a structure within which we could continue productive conversations with the town. Um, that's why there are three identified alternatives. However, the trustees, four of the trustees who spoke to this, having voted for that motion, expressed a strong preference that uh, if the library was going to have to make a financial commitment we would hope that we could reach an agreement in which the financial commitment, if the library was going to have to expend any funds from whatever source, could be dedicated to library uses, meaning to the purposes of the capital improvement. So while the vote was unanimous in favor of this uh, motion, four trustees after the motion spoke and were very clear about what their preference was. But the hope was that this would provide a framework for continuing productive conversations with the town. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sharon, uh, Colin, you and then uh, ask if you would like Sean to put the motion from last night on the screen if it's available. I just wanted to say one more thing. I think it was Bernie today and Michelle last night, Lynn, uh, talking about uh, this initiative with Mindy and Joe, um, I, I just had a conversation today with many of the 14 libraries, including um, the, one of the select people from Deerfield. Anyways, we're, we are all moving forward. We will be writing letters and emails, but I will be sending to all of you a, a kind of um, a, a template, and I hope that all of you, I invite the trustees, the friends of the library, every single town councilor, whether you're in favor of this project or not, to uh, send letters to your legislators asking for help to fill the gap. So I will be sending that uh, information to you tomorrow. Thank you. John, do you have a motion or to put it on quickly or not? Um, tell me if, um, Sharon, I have the, I think it's on Jones Library letterhead, has a nice owl in the background reading a book, um, has three different motions. Is that, let me put it on the screen and tell me if that's the right one. 
I don't think it was in the packet, but is this the right one? Uh, that Sean? is, yeah. Okay. Jeez. Is that Sammy? Should I say, is that Sammy the owl? That, okay, sorry. That's probably not <laughs> good of me to, yeah. So I just want to give you a moment to um, read the motion and then see if there are any questions about it. Nicole and Michelle, and then I probably will. This is just quick, Andy. I wasn't sure. Were you calling public comment earlier when you said I haven't seen any hands? I, no, no, I, sort of... I have not. Um, I'm okay. going to call public comment in the moment. Okay, uh, great. Thank I you. Wanted, that's why I wanted to finish the motion, get the motion out there so that everybody sees it. And then um, what, what I'm proposing is public comment, and then I'm going to call on Lynn to see if she has a motion. So um, anything further the trustees want to say or, uh, about the motion or the um, questions from the committee? Alex? Yeah, I'd just like to echo, I think, what's probably already been said, but one, um, you know, I appreciate that this is a large, scary amount. I certainly am not involved in fundraising of this ma of this magnitude, um, but I do, like Lynn said, feel after after talking with people, felt much better about um, the prospects of fundraising and trusting in people who do this professionally. Um, and I think that this is a rather elegant solution that I like because, from my perspective. It enables us to go forward. It takes the risk away from the town. If we don't proceed, um, we have repairs. Um, we've moved into emergency mode around our HVAC system and are dealing with emergency issues every year, um, and that's not going away. Um, and so, you know, we know there's going to be a cost to the town. We know it's a minimum of 16 to 19 million, but we don't really know what that cost is because I would like to think that if we did a repair, we we wouldn't just do the bare minimum, you know, to keep the building operational for the next 20 years. I'd, I'd like to think that we would do something more than that. Um, and so for me, this was a nice way for us to proceed to a number certain so that everybody can really start talking numbers. And, you know, to Alicia's point, right, it's hard to when you're not dealing with actual numbers, it's really hard because you can't put scenarios together because there's about a thousand different scenarios. Um, but when we get to the bids, all of a sudden we're actually looking at real numbers, real fundraising to date, and a lot more information. And there's still going to be a lot unknown. It's still going to be somewhat of a leap of faith around what fundraising can be done, but at least we'll know the cost and we'll know where we are. And if, again, this is one of the three options that I most prefer, obviously, but if we decide at that point together that it doesn't make sense to go forward, it's not the most fiscally responsible thing for the town as a whole, then, you know, we're sort of taking off from the town $2 million of that 20 million or 25, I think uh, Pam Rooney suggested that it might be, you know, um, off that number. So that's less that the town has to pay for the repair work but then the library trustees have the opportunity to go out and try to, whether it's fundraise or seek CPA or, or whatever it is. And I also want to recognize that fundraising opportunities around repairs are very different than fundraising opportunities around, uh, or, or, you know, a renovation and expansion. And so I, I don't take lightly that trying to get $2 million for this project um, if we wind up doing a repair, but I, it just, it feels like an elegant solution to take the risk off the town to allow the project to proceed. So um, I hope that we can focus on this phase and getting to the next phase and then have another conversation um, once we actually know price certain about how best to proceed. Thank you. Um, 
So I think, Sean, you could take the uh, document off the screen. I'm going to turn to the public. Um, and if anybody would like to be recognized for public comment, I appreciate raising your hand. I know we have one person who's on telephone call. That person would have to do star nine because they don't have a raised hand function through um, any other uh, through their computer system software. Uh, so if there's any public comment, uh, I'm gonna pause, and that includes from members of the council who are in attendance. Uh, if there's any public comment, um, please raise your hand. I'm bringing in uh, Jeff Lee into the room. Okay. Then I'm going to ask that um, caller identify uh, themselves and um, at least let us know what section of town you live in. You don't have to divulge an address and uh, the um, and then try and limit it to two to three minutes. I am going to time for three, but yep. I really would appreciate two. Thanks, Andy. And uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Lee. I live, I think I'm in District 5B now. <clears throat> and I appreciate what Councillor Shane and Walker uh, asked. You know, how does this really affect the capital plan as a whole. In particular, uh, we seem to be um, not talking about the debt exclusion override that's gonna be required to pay for the school project. Um, and this decision is being presented as totally independent of that, but the way I understand it, they're, they're uh, intimately connected. Um, the money that you borrow for the library project will not be available under the debt limit to borrow for the school. So all that money will have to be uh, funded through a debt exclusion override. And we taxpayers are also suffering from cost escalations. And um, you can make it very difficult on us by, by forcing us to pass a override to get the school that we want or that override may not even pass if, uh, if it's too large. So I really hope you'll uh, consider that. And just wanted to mention one other thing that troubles me is that, um, you know, we mentioned the, the library promises that it can raise, I don't know, $14 million for the uh, library project, but uh, it seems that no money has been pledged for the repair option. Uh, no fundraising for the repair option. And that doesn't seem fair to me or, or to the town. Um, if you really wanna compare the two, consider a fundraising component for the, the repair option. So those are my comments. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it, Jeff. Um, anyone else? Uh, there are no other hands raised. Trying to there are no other hands. No other hands, no. Because uh, you're seeing something I'm not seeing, so go ahead and just let me know who it is. No, I said there, there aren't any. There aren't any, I thought that was correct. Okay, um, so I appreciate the opportunity for public comment and that uh, and Jeff coming forward and sharing his concerns. Um, Lynn, uh, by putting you on the spot, but I am. <laughs> uh, had you thought about how you would like, you would propose to proceed? And make sure I have uh, what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, I'd like to make the following motion and then look for a second and then speak to the motion. The motion is to recommend that the town council reauthorize the town manager to enter into a new memorandum of agreement between the town of Amherst and the Jones Library Incorporated acting by and for its board of trustees. I hear a second. Second. 
Thank you, Michelle. So, um, then please go ahead and speak to the motion. So the original MOU did not anticipate the possibility of us abandoning the project. Uh, it also never really uh, decided who pays for what, when, uh, and it clearly did not include the um, issues of the increased numbers and the increased need for fundraising. So in order for the town to proceed in a way that protects the town, as well as makes it very clear what our relationship is with the Board of Trustees and that it continues as a good and positive relationship, I think it's important for us to go to our chief executive, whom we hired to do exactly this, and ditto a motion, if you will, that we made up back on April 5th and have him enter into this negotiation. Okay, um, I just want a clarification is I don't think since the motion set before us, this is um, a motion to make a recommendation to the council to um, the, so that the, the ultimate motion will be would be a council um, decision, but it's a question of recommend this committee recommending that motion. Um, Correct. Okay, Matt. Hi, thanks, Andy, and uh, thanks to uh, Sharon and to everybody on the board of trustees. It's it's really um, you know I, I think a town like ours, the the library is. Um, one of the most important buildings and institutions we have. Lynn, I just had one question about your motion. Um, the bid estimate that we're talking about going towards, um, is, is it implied or is it kind of assumed that we'll also get information on what a, uh, a more robust renovation project would cost? And, and if not, you know, could, could that be a part of what we're asking for? Because I, I did notice in the notes that we really weren't able to get any, any good information on um, a renovation. Uh, project. First of all, the estimate we have at this point is a repair estimate. It is not a renovation estimate. The only thing that it does do is it does trigger the upgrades necessary for accessibility. That estimate itself costs somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000. Updating that, and it was an update of an original estimate. So in order to get to that, we would be asking the trustees to spend yet more money to give us that. The second thing is renovation is a whole different story. And if we decide now or in um, whenever the next point is, I now understand it's December or it's December of 2023 or January of 2024, if we decide at that point not to continue, then we could ask for a renovation. But the project that we're looking at now and the only project that is presently on the table is the one that the MBLC is providing us a grant for. And that does not allow us to say, oh, we're not gonna do this, we're not gonna add this. It just, it is what it is. So this motion is really, to take into consideration the increased costs, the increased fundraising effort and the new conditions and have, as we did before, the town manager negotiate a new MOU or MOA. So, I mean, if we want those other things done, then we also need to be prepared for a serious change in timeline uh, for going forward. We, and we also need to be very clear about who is going to pay for the additional estimates, both in terms of uh, repair and then understanding that a renovation estimate is actually an entire new design and is a much more costly process. Kathy? Uh, I think the motion as you propose it, Lynn, is too broad. I would like to give more specific instructions. I like the wording of what the trustees agreed to. So um, I would like to, I don't, I'm not good at uh, 
writing motions, but they they made an offer that they would, as I understand it, um, and it was up on the screen, I have it in writing, they would pay the costs or reimburse the costs to get to the construction and bidding stage. And it would be all on their dime in some form if we didn't go forward. So completely abrogating our current MOU, which has the uh, much other, fe many other features in it. I think of this as a bridge MOU because we would have to, should we decide to go forward, if it were more expensive, there are gonna be different numbers in the MOU than we've got right now. But I would like the MOU to just focus on this period between now and the bids and let, um, and I understand we want to give Paul some discretion here, but I think we want to give him some guidance also. It's not, I don't want him to come back and say, hey guys, I've got you a $49 million capital project um, and there's a mortgage against the library or whatever, you know, so I want it to be more limited. So I don't know how to write it that way, but but I could support something that's recommending that with the, what the trustees have proposed to us um, to send him out to write. And I, I don't, Paul, is the right word. It's a bridge. It's something else would have to be done if we move forward at construction phase, which would be yet again, another MOU, but I don't want to just say, this is it. Um, so I'm looking for some guidance on here on how I, I can be more specific. Paul, do you want to be recognized now? Sure. So, yeah, I think uh, I appreciate any kind of guidance you would like to give. The, the agreement you know, that I will sign will, um, I think, reflect the goals that the um, trustees put in their motion. They, the idea, that approach was actually suggested by the town uh, in terms of including that. Credit Sean Magano for creative thinking on these, on these things. So, um, you know, I, I think you know, giving some latitude to being able to execute an agreement in an expeditious way, I think is more valuable than sort of defining specific think clauses that need to be in it. So I would suggest that trust is an important thing. And I think that, you know, I look at it the same way you do as a bridge. Um, how do we protect the town for a project that does not move forward and we inc are incurring a significant expense to move to that next stage? So that's how I've looked at this. So I hope that that means that we're sort of on the same page, Kathy. Okay, can I just add, do a follow-up? So if I didn't say the specific wordy. Could it yep. be along the lines of what the trustees have proposed, you know, to yep. proceed along those lines? So it's we've got their wording, but that gives you a lot of does, would that give you a lot of latitude? No, I think <laughs> um I would say that, that that wording is our wording. Um so <laughs> Yeah. So, so. It, it does it doesn't undermine what you might want to do. So I'm just so you're saying don't be super specific, but I'm just looking for something. I, Lynn just said go out and get an M, new MOU, and I just want to be a well. A we little, it, yeah. yeah. If so, uh, what I'm saying is that the wording that the trust if you say if you think the trustees are in line with what you want to do, um, that's where we want to be as well in terms of si signing this agreement. but you can choose, the, the council can choose what it wants to do. Let me um, call a few other counselors and get back to Lynn. Uh, Michelle? That was my question about the process. So um, if we approve this motion, then Paul and Sean work on a new or a bridge MOU. And then, so we're recommending that to the council. The council agrees to that and then they go out, they do their thing. And then does that M o MOU come back to the council for feedback or further discussion um, to give the full council the ability to offer? Okay. When it would be signed and executed. Let me uh, call on Alicia and then Lynn. Alicia. Um, thank you. So I um, appreciate where Kathy was going with some of the changes, but I am wondering, so like hypothetically, if we were to approve the change in the MOU, the 
next thing that would have to happen after we got the bids would be the town council would have to authorize or take a vote to authorize the borrowing for the new amount for the new estimate. I think that is the next decision point. Uh, we, you should, Paul or Sean, can talk about this a little bit too. Yeah. Do you want me to? You go. go ahead, sorry. Sean. Go ahead, Andy. Okay. Um, yeah. No, Alicia. Last night you asked a great question, just to sort of the timeline, and we've started um, mapping that out. So we should have uh, sort of a good timeline um, for you. If it, if it's on the packet already, we should have something before the nineteenth. But um, the two decision points we see for the council would be this one coming up uh, to authorize the town manager. Um, to work on this MOA, and then the next time it would come back to the council would be when we uh, when the project comes back for additional funding, um, which again, would, right now the plan is for that to happen after construction bids are open. I, I, I would just want to correct that additional borrowing authorization, not yep. necessarily additional funding. So the, the yep, council ultimately has to approve the entire borrowing authorization. Yeah, the requirement by the MBLC is that there's a borrowing authorization for the, all the eligible costs of the project, which we anticipate will be higher than what it is right now. And as you know, from our discussion last week, I put, um, put the order on the screen that had the borrowing authorization, and it actually had a box on it that broke it down into um, really four sections, because it's a CPA grant and the um, MBLC grant, the um, amount that the town was committing and the pledge from the Jones Library, which was through, mostly through fundraising, but the other mechanisms that we've discussed. So uh, it's that that borrowing authorization is going to, uh, would have to increase, um, but um, the decision on whether the town's commitment increases is a separate decision. Uh, so the MOU that we are working or we are voting to see whether or not we recommend right now doesn't change the overall bar the overall amount that we are committing to borrowing, or it does. Does not. Lynn, I'm going to call on you because you might have an answer to that too. Uh, Alicia, I, it, it does not, the MOU uh, as it presently exists or would be uh, renegotiated does not increase borrowing at this time. The point at which we would have to increase borrowing is once we know what the cost of the project is with much firmer figures. And that's the point at which the council has to then authorize additional borrowing capacity. So because MS, Mass Board of Library Commissioners requires that the town borrow up to the full amount of the contract, that does not mean the town has itself said, we will put more money toward the project. It just means we have to borrow that amount and then we get reimbursed from MBLC, we get reimbursed from the trustees, and of course we contribute our amount. But what is on the table now is mer merely trying to create an MOU that reflects what the library trustees have talked about last night and voted on. I personally think it's a terrific solution um, and it gives everybody skin in the game, if you will. I just like it that way. And um, so, but it does not mean that we have agreed to borrow anymore. And it does not mean that we have agreed to pay any more town money. Can I um, add to that too, Andy? Yes. And then I have another comment, but go ahead. Um, and just to, to really hone in. So this MOA is, or the, the amendment being considered is really what happens in the next two phases and what happens if the project doesn't move forward. Um, so this project or the, the, you know, what's being contemplated right now um, would be to get through to construction bidding, it's gonna cost about $1.8 million more. Um, and should the project not move forward at that point, be, um, if the construction estimates come in too high, then how would the cost be allocated and what would ha happen at that point? 
Um, so that's really what the MOA amendments, or if it's a new MOA, will focus on. So are you um, suggesting that motion is to, um, op to recommend development of an MOA that covers the, a specific period? I'm not, I'm not recommending any changes to the language. I just, just that, that is the intent of the MOA that we've been talking about is what happens for these next two phases to move to construction bidding. Andy, I, that's part of what I wanted to speak to about. I personally do not think that it's wise to just do an MOA for this bridge. I think it's wise to possibly do, leave the existing MOA intact and maybe amend it with this language that creates the bridge so that it gets us to the next decision point, at which point it now has a clause in it that says, what if we decide not to go forward? And that clause is in the amendment to this. And if we decide not to go forward, then it expels out who's going to do what. And if we decide to go forward, it leaves intact what was already in the MOU. Now, having said that, this is one reason why we pay Paul as our town manager and we retain our town attorneys to advise us on these particular kinds of issues. And so Paul could come back to us and say, hey, here's what the attorneys have advised. And I think we owe it to the attorneys and to Paul to listen to that advice. So whether the, attorney, the attorneys may say, do it as an amendment. They may say, do a whole new agreement. My bottom line is we didn't anticipate a failed project. And what we want to do is add language somewhere into some agreement that basically creates the bridge to go forward with the possibility that none of us hope happens, that at, if there's a failed project, then the money that got spent, the library trustees would put that amount equal to their own repairs of the building. Uh, thank you, and sorry, I had one other question, like follow up to that same question. So is the reason we aren't just voting on authorizing the new amount because we expect that amount to change again? I'm trying to understand like the full merit of Sean, of you can take it on or I can take it on or Paul can take it on. Which yeah, one? That, that's part of it. I think it is that um, we no. wanted to wait until the estimates until we have a concrete number to vote on. Right. And, you know, in the process of schematic design, things change. Sometimes they get more expensive, but very honestly, what they do is get more firm. And so the number that you are finally voting on when we do any additional debt authorization is a much more firm and confident number. And so voting on a number right now with this estimate would actually, I think, be not a wise decision at all because we don't know if it's gonna go up, down, whether there's additional cost savings that the library is gonna be able to find or any number of other things that could happen. And just to reiterate what the MBLC said, because we did ask them, you know, what what happens in these cases where costs go up pretty significantly, um, they had said their experience was that the municipality would go back for the in increase in the debt authorization when the final cost estimate um, of the construction document phase occurs. So we still have to look into that a little bit more, but that ha that's expected to ha happen in um, October of 2023. Um, would be when we'll get that next cost estimate by independent cost estimators. So it'll so it'll happen sometime between that cost estimate and when we open up construction bids that we would look to come back to the council for the increase in debt authorization. Okay, and so I think Sean, uh, like just a couple minutes ago, you said something about like moving us to the next steps because then at that point when the bids come in, we can then decide if those are too high. But do we not have a limit? Like what is being proposed right now is our absolute sky. We will not go above that. And if, so I'm just trying to understand why we wouldn't take that vote now. Because if we expect it to increase, are we expecting that we will then increase with the increase? Or is this our limit? Like how much is too much? 
So right now the, the town share is not changing. The town share um, that the town will contribute is 15.8 and we anticipate when it comes back to the council, it'll, it'll still be 15.8 unless some other decision is made. Um, but as to the timing of the vote, you know, Paul or Lynn or if anybody else wants to weigh in on that. Okay, let me move the line to Michelle. And... I think I might have froze earlier. Um, can you hear me? Can you just yes. let me know you can hear me. Okay, thank you. Um, so that was sort of my question. I I just I want to understand two things. One is this MOU going to be uh, reviewed by the full council before it is executed? That's question number one. Um, and number two, because I, I do agree with what Paul was saying, that I think the trust piece and the intention of what was uh, put in the motion um, by the trustees will be reflected. However, the part that I'm a little bit confused about now is I didn't realize it was going to be for two phases. Sean, you said it will take us out two phases. So I was sort of thinking that it was going to get us to the bids and then there would be another discussion. That's um, what it will. That, that is what, so there are two phases between now and the bids. There's design development and construction documents, and then we go to bids. Um, so it, okay. so it, it will just get us to that bidding phase, but there's just, there are two phases in between now and then. Gotcha. Okay. And so the MOU will not spell out how the decision is made about whether to go forward or not. It's not going to say some upper limit or some dollar. It, it might. So, you know, we've had some conversations around putting in the MOU, the, you know, framework for how the project would move forward. So, or just being very clear that at that, um, when bids are opened, um, the council will have to take action. So that's one uh, decision that will have to be made at that point before the town manager could execute a contract that will determine if the project goes forward. Um, you know, another one might be to review the fundraising at that point and see if it's on track. Um, so, so in addition to what we've talked about with the MOA so far, it could lay out sort of the framework for, you know, does the project move forward from that point? Right, but the actual decision about whether it moves forward will still be a matter of discussion at that point. It, it's, yeah, it will it, always go back to the council. Okay, that was my concern. It's yeah. not like laid out if it because nope. there's going to be a so, lot of opinions. unless unless the construction bids come in really low and we can all cross our <laughs> and we can all cross <laughs> our fingers know. on that if, if they <laughs> come in within the original that authorization, then we're, right. we're good. But. So okay. so I can't sign any construction documents unless all the funding is in place. And so that is a requirement from the town council. Like there's nothing, I'm not allowed to sign anything until the funding is in place. Only the council can put the funding in place. You've said you've established a certain number, but it's, it's likely to be different than the number you've already established. And that's why when we get to construction bid, we have firm numbers and that's when the council um, can vote and they can choose to not to approve or not approve at that moment in time. Thank you. And I also appreciate that Sean pointed out there was another uh, cost estimate that will come in, I think you said in October, which is something that I had heard in the meeting last night. And I think it's important that folks know that there's going to be this next milestone that we'll, we'll get to hear um, additional or new cost estimates. And not, and not this October, next October, yes, uh, yeah. Yeah, a year from now. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I want to just come back to Paul. I understand. I don't want to tie your hands. Um, so Lynn is talking about this as an amendment. I, uh, a bridge MOU, something that would indicate this is only getting us to this next point is what I'd like in the wording of the motion, Lynn. And my understanding from what we're hearing is where this, the number is in the 1.8 million, somewhere 1.5 to 2. Of it's 1.8. 1.8 is the number that is, it was, it's had a range before now it's settled right in the middle, which yeah. is not surprising, um, but that that's the number that's um, contained in the trustees assurance that um, it, it gets paid back in some way if we don't move forward. So it just, so the content of this bridge, so I'd like the idea bridge somewhere, a bridge to amend the other. And then the other thing I, I would request from those of you who are deep in the building project, um, you're gonna learn a lot as these bids come in. And I realize we don't have a plan B, 
that's a renovation and repair, but we will have an estimate on some of what is in historic Jones that will be more concrete than you have now. So you will be getting some information um, on the cost of the exterior, the cost of the roof, the cost of the HVAC systems, which are now in a maybe frame, um, that I wouldn't want to lose that information if we should have to pivot. Um, and I, I realize that's not the same, Alex, as, as a full-blown, but the 14 million, which is now 16 million, had a couple million in there for a design thing, but it didn't ever envision clean carpets and moving things around. It literally was just fixing stuff. Um, so I just would like to collect that information, you know, make sure we we have it. And um, something in me doesn't, I would hate to, it's hard to use the word waste, but to spend another 1.8 million, whether it's your money, town money, anybody's money and not get anything for it. Should we go where Matt was saying, what about renovation? Just gathering information as we go along that I know is not quite the same because we're now talking about making a decision October, 2023. Um, and I saw your timeline, Alex or others who put that together. If we, it's Then we have to go design, we have to do a lot of other things. So, and meanwhile, everything's falling apart. So I would, if we had to pivot, I would, if I'm still around on JCPC, I would welcome a $16 million request from Jones along with figure out how to get CPA money, how to grab some of those donations that Bob said may still be on the table to, to do a good job on fixing what's wrong with the library, making the ADA, and having it look spiffy when we when we walk in, you know, it's it's got some absolutely gorgeous features in it, but they they get clouded by everything else that's going on, um, which is understandable since you're planning on doing this big project. So that's my plea: is not to make the best of this next phase and gather that information. Um, since we're in this unreal world of what's the price of anything since it keeps changing around us. Um, so thank you. Okay. I'm gonna keep um, going for a little bit, but um, I urge the people who have hands up to limit to two minutes at maximum. Alicia. Oh, so I think my hand was just still up from before, but also I think that nobody answered the last question that I asked um, regarding the timeline for the decision um, for authorizing the borrowing for the full amount versus the MO versus like amending the MOU and what the merit and the difference is there and why, like, is there something, is there something we're waiting for or something that's preventing us from just making that decision now rather than amending the MOU? Anyone want to speak to the timeline? Because I know you've been... It's October. I think Sean did to some extent answer that. We will have our next best estimate in October of 2023. It's at that point that because of what we've gone through, which is uh, the design development and the construction documents that we would actually be able to have a much more firm and reliable cost. And it's at that point that we make the decision when we vote on increasing bond authorization. Alicia, so the, yeah, the mean? cost that we vote on has to be exactly the right number. Like, so the authorization that exists now cannot continue because the number is different or it can be in the ballpark. Because again, the second part of my question was when we talked about if the bids come in and it's too much, like how do we know what is too much? And are we expecting them to be higher than what we have right now? And so why we would not just take a vote to authorize that amount, unless we are thinking that we are going to be authorizing for higher. Paul or Sean, do you want to get yeah. into uh, public bidding? <laughs> yeah, so so I think the idea is that the council would only vote one more time on this on this on this debt authorization. Uh, otherwise, to keep coming back to the council for repeated votes because we don't know what that number is yet. And to put a number out there, I would not be confident in putting any number in front of the council at this moment in time. We don't have enough information to ask you to vote on anything. Uh, you voted once to um, 
indicate the support for the project. Now our job is to get you to a number that you can vote with confidence um, to borrow to authorize the borrowing for. So I think the idea is not to give you a number that's it's and whatever number we gave you today would be not accurate. So it would not be fair for the council to vote on something that you would rightly say how confident are you in this number today, you know, September 14th. And I would say um, not confident at all because we need to get the vote, we need to continue with the design, do the value engineering, get a, a firm number, and then the council decides if you want to move forward on the project or not. The other piece is that in public bidding, um, you really, it, what you do is you put a number out there for an estimate on the project. And basically that either encourages people to bid or encourages people to come in maybe even lower. Uh, but you want to be very sure that the project can be done for that cost. And you don't want to be putting on a number that's lower than you might need or a number that's just not firm. Public bidding is very different than mortgaging or bidding on a house. It's, it's just a different animal. Okay, so it's not that it can't happen. It's just that we don't think it's the best course of action. That would be definitely true, but it, I mean, we could do it, but then we might have to come back and do it again. And even then it's in the public bidding world, putting out a number now when we don't have reliable design development and construction documents is really not very wise. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think there's one other thing that I'll throw out, and this is not my role as chair, but as a member, and that is that um, I'm hoping we get um, a better um, number from the MBLC as a result of the efforts that we're making with our legislative delegation and in consortium with many, many other communities that are in similar positions. So, there's that additional unknown. Um, let's get two more comments and then see if we can move to a vote. One is that while uh, this is principally a committee discussion, Bob set his hand up for a while. Bob? Just a quick clarification, I think. Um, the number that we've been talking about is the million eight or so, which is the additional costs of going from here to the end of a bidding process. Um, in addition to that, there's about $400,000, which has already been spent. So the amount that would have to be returned to the MBLC is actually more of the order of $2.2 million. There's also one other point, which is that this assumes that we go all the way to the bidding rather than stopping at um, a new cost estimate. If we stop at cost estimate, then the architects are limited to what they have actually built rather than a fixed sum, which is um, built into it uh, if we get all the way to the bids. Mm -hmm. And so that might reduce it a little bit, but I'm just saying that you should just be aware that what we're talking about is returning to the, to the MBLC $2.2 million from the town or from the library, but from somebody. Um, Just can I clarify? Um, sure. So two kind of separate things. So there's the money the MBLC has given us, which they give you sort of one fifth of the total grant. Um, every year you hit a milestone. So Sharon, you might have the exact number, but they've given us a fifth. It's not based on any exact costs. It's just, they've given us a fifth. Um, at the same time, we are incurring costs for design and OPM work. So uh, Bob's right, we've incurred about $400,000 so far and the projection to get through bidding is 1.8. So the, maybe the total spent on the project at that point would be about 2.2 or something like that. Um, but that is not what would go back to the MBLC. What will go back to the MBLC is whatever they gave us for that first milestone payment. Um, which it may, it's going to be in the two range. So it's in a similar range, but it's, um, but those two are not linked together. The MBLC yeah, roughly, just fifth. Yeah, it's roughly $2.7 million that, that they yeah, have. So that whole 2.7 will have to go back to the MBLC. So, so we would return to them the money that we still keep in an account, 
plus we would replace the money that has been spent, which would be $2.2 million right. or thereabouts from the town or from the library. Right. If you think about the, the sources and that debt authorization, um, right now the 2.2 because is coming out of the town's debt, uh, the town share essentially, the 15.8. Um, because and, and until we just know the project's moving forward, it won't come out of the MBLC share until we know that it's going to continue because otherwise that money will have to go back. Uh, Bob. Yeah, I just, uh, I want to just uh, say that I think the, uh, the approach that we're recommending um, makes sense and is a prudent approach. And I think it'll, it'll, it'll work, be the best approach we can make given the uncertainties. Um, I do just want to um, caution that by October of next year, the council needs to have a pretty good idea about how much the four projects, capital projects are gonna cost and how we're gonna finance them. Because we can't make a decision on one without understanding the bigger decision uh, on all four. Um, and uh, my tenure on the finance committee comes to an end in June, so I may not be around <laughs> to kind of remind everybody uh, next October. So uh, I just do want to say we, we, we need to have a better understanding before we can make a, a sound decision on one of the four projects or two of the four projects. That's all. Andy, quickly, if I can respond to that. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, by that point, we'll, we'll know, well, we'll have better estimates for the library. We'll know about the school project. Um, we may or may not know about the DPW's costs at that point in terms of having exact numbers. Um, and we likely won't know the fire station. We have better estimates for the fire station, but we won't have um, bids, I, I can't imagine at that point. But I think we will have a lot better information to have a, a more detailed plan at that point. Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting that we would have exact numbers for all four, but we should have better estimates and we should know what the it, what the interest rates are and, and have a better understanding how we're going to finance them. Mm -hmm. So um, anything else otherwise, so I would um, ask Lynn to, if you have it available, to just read the motion again to, so everybody knows what they're voting on, and then um, I'm going to call for vote. I'm going to share it on the screen. So um, with that said, I'm going to um, start voting. And I think I'm just going to randomly pick and then go alphabetical from there. Um, Bernie? Um, I'm in support. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Kathy? I am still uncomfortable with this because it doesn't say bridge, it's too broad. So I'm gonna vote no, but I am in support of the bridge idea. Okay, I'm voting yes. Um, so Alicia? No, for the same reason that Kathy voted no. Lynn? Yes. And uh, Bob? I support. And uh, Matt? I support. Okay, so the vote is three yes, two no from the voting members and three members of the committee who are resident members support the decision um, that was just made by the majority. So we have completed. Is there anything else that we have? Michelle, I see your hand up. I just want to say that in my observation, I think we were mostly on the same page and I would hate to see this not go through with a, a unanimous recommendation because of some wording. So I, I'm not, I know it's six o'clock, we've been here for a couple hours, but I'm just wondering if Kathy and Alicia have some wording um, that they can contribute that would make them comfortable um, to vote 
you know, in favor of this and in support of this, um, I don't see why we wouldn't try to work through that for a couple more minutes. Because I don't think that we're, I think we're on the same page based on my observations. So I'm just looking to you, Andy, as a chair, but also to Kathy and Alicia to see if there's just some wording we can add and, and, um, and vote again. I think if I recall the council rules, we would need a motion to reconsider. Is that That's your correct. Question, Glenn? Yes. So yeah. Michelle needs to make a motion to reconsider. It needs to be seconded. We need to vote it real quick and then move on to a motion being placed on the floor, which can be a brand new motion. Okay, so unless, I'd, I'd like unless to- Unless you take a friendly amendment. Yep. That's true. <laughs> After all, it's a committee meeting. So I, I'd like to make a motion to reconsider unless a friendly amendment is the easier uh, pathway here. I'd like to make a motion to reconsider. And looking to be you voted. Have to do the motion to reconsider because we just passed a motion. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion to reconsider. Second. Okay, so it's, uh, we have a motion to second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Michelle, you want to speak to it or Kathy, you want to speak to it? I saw your hands up and now not. I think I said just, I think we can get there. I really do. And I'd like to see us do that if okay, possible. I'm, I'm going to. Um, start voting and I'm going to go uh, just one one notch down on the alphabetical list and start again. So Michelle? Aye. And uh, Kathy? Yes. Um, I will vote yes. Uh, Alicia? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Bob? Or um, Matt? Support. And Bernie. Yeah, we're all among friends, so I'll support it. <laughs> so this was uh, a motion to reconsider that was uh, unanimous and uh, in support of all three members who are resident members of the committee. Therefore, uh, motion is back on the table and uh, if somebody wants to uh, suggest different wording that is uh, presently on the screen. Uh, that needs to be a motion. Uh, Kathy, your hand is up. Okay, I'll take a stab and I'm trying to keep as much as here. So to enter into a new memorandum of agreement with an addenda or an amendment that includes a bridging agreement. for the time period up to, and then is it the receipt of the construction bids, whatever the, the right wording is. John, does that wording make sense? Bridging up to the period to the receipt of the construction bids? does i think once it's settled that want to maybe ask a question about what it means what the intent is yeah so, so i'm just trying to to say that we're not re really rewriting the entire thing we're adding a clause an addendum an amendment that gets a, has this new agreement that gets us to what happens during this next phase so i don't care what the wording is i just am uncomfortable both with trying to explain this to residents, just go out and negotiate a new agreement. We're talking about a particular time period um, and we know what we're talking about. So as I said, I, I'm not good at the exact wording. So I'm using the word bridging because that's what we used. Lynn talked about an addendum or an amendment. <laughs> so it wasn't. And, and then we know that Paul and the legal counsel are gonna have to figure out how to word all this thing. So that's my intent, just to make it more specific that um, that this this isn't 
redealing how much the town share is going to be or anything. It's just getting us through this next, what, 10 month, 11 month, 12 month yeah. period. Andy, can I follow up quickly on yeah. with a, a question and a comment? So, um, so the question would be, so based on that, you would not want us to update, you'd want us to keep the existing amendment or the existing MOA, not update any of the numbers, which are based on sort of the, the previous project budget, but keep that in place. And instead of entering into a new agreement, what I would suggest what you're saying is to enter into and then start with addendum amendment right there um, as, oppo as opposed to the part that says new MOA. So I think Paul is about to say why this is problematic because our MO, or, or, or Paul, go on. So that I'm just looking for something that talks about this concept. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that actually this is fine. What you're saying is, you know, you have an agreement. I just want to make sure you're saying, I want to make sure this bridging agreement is is included in this agreement, is in the, the new MOA. And yep. I think this that's what these words say. With an addendum amendment that includes a bridging agreement. That's precisely what you're saying. And I that's I don't have a problem with that at all. That makes a lot okay. of sense. But just clarifying, is it a new MOA or is it our existing MOA? With I, I think, well, I think we have to talk to the trustees about that. Well, it still has that clause drawn at the very beginning, a new that now has this addendum. In, yeah, okay, so I didn't, I was trying to leave as much of the words there as possible. <laughs> yeah. And I would be able to explain this. Is that what, that's what I'm, I'm partly looking for. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to ask for a second. Second. Okay. Uh, so speaking regarding the motion on the floor that's now been made and seconded, Alicia. Oh, sorry. My hand was up for wording suggestions. So I, I don't have anything else, else to offer right now. I'm always open to wording suggestions, Alicia. <laughs> Just, uh, well, no, it was, I put it up in the beginning when we were talking about it and I, I was going to say something very similar, but more along the lines of the phases. So I think that this is in line with what I was going to say. And I, I've taken out the word new and I rearranged where the phrase with an addendum amendment that includes a bridging agreement for the time period up to receipt of the construction bids. Just grammatical reasons that's better grammar <laughs> yes thank you bob ernie this is one of those rare occasions where a preamble would have done it but um since you've got this motion i think we're, we can move forward okay anything else uh, in that case um i'll go back to the same voting pattern that i was in before move down one andy more. andy can i just jump in one, sorry again this is super super technical and um you know i looked at paul whether you think this matters do we want to say receipt of construction bids is that really when we want the time period to go up until uh, maybe that's too technical and maybe we could so no, maybe I think that, that's a really good point because there, there, so there are certain things that trigger at at the receipt of construction bids and i, I, I was we want to say uh, creation of construction yeah or do we want to say review of construction bids? I'd leave it a little more vaguer up to construction bids. What do you think, Sean? Maybe action by the council. Um, but you know, when the next when it comes back to action by the council, um, which would give it a little more flexibility in the time. Yeah. I just worry if we say receipt of construction bids, you know, we haven't opened them yet. You know, we don't know yeah. what they are. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is better, but I just wanted to. Make sure it's super after clear. receipt of construction bids. Yeah, I, you could say after receipt of construction bid bids. Uh, and the only reason I wouldn't put that is if we do decide there's a requirement to. I mean, we could amend this again if we need to, but right. um, if there is a requirement that we do it sooner than construction bids, to have the council is required to take action before that. But right. This is where I, again, I. I want to make sure with Kathy and Alicia that this embodies your desire. Okay. And then I think we have to turn it over to Paul and Sean and our attorneys to come back 
with any changes and details about this. So I've got a better suggestion. How about okay. for the time period um, for a bridging agreement um, for the time period prior to moving to um, construction? So that'll, I think that means we're not gonna go to that next phase. This agreement goes up until the, the bidding phase and opening the bids and anything that is involved there. Um, and the agreement goes up until we would advance to construction because um, we want to do that until contracts are signed. I have to ask if that's agreeable to yep. the uh, seconder. Yeah, or would it be? Oh, sorry. Could we do prior to the selection of the bid? Or do we need to choose the actual bid itself? Well, you can't move to construction unless we selected a bidder. So I think this language works. So you're okay with the wording, Kathy? I am okay. You know, I was just trying to get this bridging that we're talking about a particular time period. Mm -hmm. And I think this now does it where everyone's trying to define exactly what the time period is. Um, the, the library trustees motion actually provided those words, um, whatever those words were. And that's all I was trying to do is get away from the carte blanche of a brand new memo memorandum, but something that focused on this initial period that we're grappling with. We're giving this, this is giving a recommendation for a green light for a particular time period is what I'm, what I think we're asking Paul to go out and negotiate and write it in ways all of us can understand. <laughs> Sorry, and just, uh, ahead, Andy, can we check with Alicia to see if this captures for her? Yeah, this is okay. So Kathy and Lynn, are you okay? Because you're the maker and seconder. I'm fine. Yes. Okay, so then we'll go back to voting one last time. And I'm gonna start with Kathy this time. Yes. And that'll be yes. Uh, Alicia? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Bob? Uh, Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. And Michelle? Aye. Okay, so it is unanimous with uh, support from the three resident members. So that concludes it. And I think um, I want to take the time, I don't know who's left in the audience from the library trustees and staff. Um, see Sharon's still here. Uh, so I want to just thank you very much for um, working with us and um, educating us, uh, kind of everybody. You've all been really wonderful and uh, we very much appreciate it. So, um, at this point, I just want to say one thing to my committee, and then I'm just going to adjourn um, because it's it's later than we wanted it to be. Uh, there are a lot of issues that have been referred to the finance committee that we have not had the opportunity to discuss, and I wanted to make sure that all of the committee was aware of the burdens that are going forward um, and that we're going to have to develop a work plan that is going to enable us to get at that variety of issues. The things that the council has referred recently to us are um, financial consequences of the proposal to have trash hauling um, performed as a town service with composting as an um, an additional feature. The street light proposal that was made at a week ago at the meeting and the street acceptance proposal um, that has been made um, but is needs a lot of work on it uh, having to do with accepting Hopbrook Road and Kestrel Trust. And uh, the fourth one is uh, the uh, special act that has been proposed to um, submit to the legislature enable, that would enable Amherst to um, 
create a taxation on real estate transfer. Um, so uh, those um, have been mostly referred to more than one committee. I think the Hopbrook Kestrel is just referred to finance and then and uh, so we do need to get that plus we are getting to a season where we're getting close to the um, the, the the budget projections for the next fiscal year and uh, so that has to move um, um, for, that starts the process where we get into doing a draft um, for the council of council guide budget guidelines and uh, there's other issues that um, have been suggested that we consider um, that are uh, things that I just can't at this point list that take too long to do that. But there is a list of things that for us to consider. So we are entering into a period where there's just going to be a lot of demands on us. And um, I want to work with you to think about ways to do this most efficiently and effectively so that we can fulfill our responsibilities. Um, and uh, I will not do that for the minutes to, tonight, but it was a forewarning for them. Um, and I may do part of it by memorandum and um, schedule another meeting. The next two Tuesdays are going to be difficult to schedule because of uh, Jewish religious holidays interfere with both um, of the next Tuesdays, I believe. Uh, but uh, I, with that, is there anything else that people wish to bring up that is unanticipated business? Um, I know that uh, there's going to be disappointed by Athena that we didn't get to the uh, minutes, but I just can't do it tonight. So with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.